Steps to Wisdom is the title of our series. Listen, my son, is the title of today's sermon. And our passage comes from Proverbs chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Proverbs chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Let me just read the passage for us. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. They are a garland to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. Amen. Steps to Wisdom is the title of our series, and this is really is the goal of our series. This is the second sermon, but this is the goal. What is the goal? For us to keep walking towards wisdom. Wisdom doesn't come to us instantaneously. Knowledge can sometimes. I know it takes a lot of time off sometimes to gain certain piece of knowledge, but knowledge could come to us just in an instant. But wisdom doesn't come to us that way. It takes years of walking faithfully and persistently towards wisdom. That's the only way we gain wisdom in our lives. What's the reason for that? Because wisdom is not something that you have it in your possession and just take it out and use it in certain situations. But wisdom is all about the person. What I mean by that is, in order for us to have wisdom, which I defined as being right choices and the ability to make the right choices in all circumstances and situations, for us to be able to do that and be wise in that way, we have to become a person of wisdom ourselves. Because it is through the person that we are, it is through the wise person that we are, that wisdom comes out of us. It's not just something you can take out of your pocket and use, like a formula. So for example, like those of you who are good with your hands and you're good at, you know, carpentry and stuff like that, I'm not. So even if you gave me this fancy electric saw, you know, that you plug it in and you go, and then you cut everything on the woods, right? You can give me that tool, but it means nothing to me, and I won't be able to do anything. Because when it comes to that wisdom, I'm not a person of wisdom in that field. And and I would just be so scared. I'm like, I know there's safety and stuff, but, you know, measure. But I'm like, no, no, I don't want to cut my finger, you know. Because I'm not a wise person when it comes to those kind of tools. It's the person who's wise, makes wise decisions. And for us to have wisdom, we have to become a wise person. That takes many years. It doesn't just happen overnight. So through this series, we want to take, start taking steps towards wisdom. And no guarantee that by the end of this series that you will become a wise person. Because again, it takes years. But what we want to do together is just start taking one step at a time towards wisdom so that over the years, as you continue to walk towards it, that you will become a person of wisdom. So what was the first step that we needed to take? Last week, we we talked about the fear of the Lord. What does it mean to fear the Lord? To trust Him. To completely trust that He is good God, what He says is true, and you believe what He says is true. That's the first step. Now, what is the second step towards wisdom? Well, as we see in our passage, verse 8 especially, it says, listen. It begins by saying, listen. That's the second step towards wisdom. For us to become people of wisdom, we need to take that step of listening to our God. But unfortunately, when we actually look at the entire story of the Bible and we read through it, what we see is that in one way, it's actually a story of sons who don't listen to their father in heaven. And we want to talk about a couple of these sons today, sons who don't listen to their father in heaven. And the first son that we want to look at is Adam. If you open up the Bible, Genesis 1 to 3, we have this account, right? Creation account and the fall. How human beings fall away from God's will through their sin. Well, when you open up those chapters at the beginning of Genesis, God clearly shows us who He is, who we are, and how we are to live. Who is God? He is our creator. Who are we? We are His creature. And it makes clear that He has this world that He has created for us. 
And he's a, he's a God who speaks to us and shows us how we are to live in the world that he's created. And we as his creatures are to listen and hear what he says, how we should live, and we are to live accordingly. That's how God defines who he is and who we are. That's the relationship in which we are created to live. So Genesis chapter 2, what God does is he speaks. He speaks to Adam and shows him what his will and desire for him is. So Genesis chapter 2 verse 15. Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So God has created this garden, put him in there and says, enjoy everything that I have created for you. It's yours to enjoy. But just this one fruit, don't eat that fruit. Don't eat from that one tree I show you not to eat from. But what does Adam do? What do the human beings do? They do not listen. Instead, they listen to the voice and the words of the serpent. And they also listen to the voice of their own thoughts and desire. And they eat the fruit. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. So what was at the root of their disobedience? Sin against God? Distrust of what God has said? They refused to listen. They refused to listen what God has told them not to do. Friends, when you and I refuse to hear God and listen to our own voices, we also fall. So that's the first son in the Bible who refuses to hear and listen to God. There's a second son in the Bible, and that son who refuses to hear is the son Israel. Exodus chapter 4 verse 22 calls the nation of Israel God's son, firstborn. As you see there, this is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son. Why does God call the Israelites and Israel his first son? Well, it's because they were the nation that God first chose to begin his work of salvation. And it was through that nation that Messiah Jesus came. But it was through initially them that the gospel spread to the, all the other nations. So thereby, spiritually, they were chosen to be that firstborn who will serve all the other sons of God and children of God that are to follow. That's why they are called the firstborn, and the son of God. But what does this son do, Israel? Well, God saves them out of Egypt, right? They were slaves, but God brings them out and says, I will take you to the promised land, land flowing with milk and honey, and you will journey through the wilderness, and you will reach the promised land. And this trip that's supposed to take about 40 days ends up becoming 40 years because they refuse to obey God and keep distrusting him. And through their disobedience, what God says is, I'm going to wait until all the first generations that came out of Egypt die. I'll wait until all the second generations are born. And when they're ready, I'm going to take you into the promise. So it took them 40 years. And now they're finally about to go into the promised land. And Moses, who is about to now pass on to go and be with the Lord, God calls Moses to give these Israelites his final sermon. And that final sermon is recorded in a book that we know as the book of Deuteronomy. And when you get to the book of Deuteronomy, in that book, you will come to a passage that captures the essence of the entire Old Testament. This command that Jewish people thousands of years have lived by and cited every morning and evening prayer. And it's Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 to 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength. This is the commandment that I want you to keep. And not only that, this is so important that I want you to write it on your heart. Now impress them on your children. Teach them. Talk about it with your children. Make sure you have this command with you all the time and try to live by this commandment all the time. But if you actually look at that commandment, How does it begin? It begins by saying, hear. 
He begins by saying, listen, my people. In fact, the word listen in the book of Deuteronomy appears 95 times. So we know what the heart of this book's message is. Listen, listen to what I have to say. I'm sure some of you have heard that term, Shema. That's prayer that Jewish people cite. And this word Shema is actually a Hebrew word, command, that basically means hear. So that word hear is basically Shema. So God gives these words to the Israelites, and then they go into the promised land. Now, this is where having spent 40 years in the wilderness because they refused to listen. So what do you think they will do once they go into the promised land? Listen to God? Hope so, but that's not what they do. They refuse to listen to Him yet again. So what happens? God builds them into this great nation, just as He had promised in the promised land. But because, of, because they refuse to hear and listen to God, God, the kingdom is divided into two, northern kingdom and southern kingdom, and they are both destroyed. Northern kingdom at the hands of the Assyrian Empire and the southern kingdom at the hands of the Babylonian Empire. And through that context of the southern kingdom being destroyed by the Babylonians comes a certain group of prophets. One of them is by the name of Jeremiah. And there's a book after him in the Bible that he spoke and uh, uh, the message that he spoke to the people. And in that book, Jeremiah spends 40 years preaching to the people of the southern kingdom. Not four years, 40 years. But what do these people of God do? They refuse to listen again. And when we go to this book, it shows us why these people do not listen to God. Jeremiah chapter 32, 33. They turn their backs to me and not their faces. Though I taught them again and again, they would not listen or respond to discipline. God spoke to them for 40 years. And they, they didn't listen or hear God because they had their backs turned from, uh, to Him. And they were facing something else. And they were so focused on that thing that they did not hear and listen to God. Jeremiah twenty two twenty one 21 tells us another reason why they didn't hear and listen to God. I warned you when you felt secure, but you said, I will not listen. This has been your way from your youth. You have not obeyed me. What does that mean? Well, he says, well, you have not obeyed me, listened to me since your youth days. What that means is that you're in, you are in your DNA. That's in your spiritual DNA. And you continue to refuse to hear me or listen to me and listen to what I have to say because it's in you to go against what I want to tell you. And you refuse to hear it. It's in your nature, God says. Now the southern kingdom is destroyed. And then historically now there's a governor who is in place. And he gets assassinated. So those who fear the Babylonians, because Babylonians are the ones that put this governor in charge, come to Jeremiah and ask him, well, what should we do? Our uh, um, a governor is killed and Babylonians are going to come again and destroy us again. Should we flee to Egypt? Jeremiah, please talk to God, see what he has to say. And if you tell us what God tell, to, tells you, we will obey. So Jeremiah says, okay, I'll go talk to God, seek him and Bring his message to you. So verse 7, chapter 42, Jeremiah comes back. Ten days later, he comes back and he says this to them. Verse 9, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, to whom you sent me to present your petition, says, if you stay in this land, I will build you up and not tear you down. I will plant you and not up uproot you, for I have relented concerning the disaster I have inflicted on you. Do not be afraid of the king Babylon, whom you now fear. Do not be afraid of him, declares the Lord, for I am with you and will save you and deliver you. So they said, well, now that the governor is killed, are the Babylonians going to come and destroy us again? Jeremiah, what should we do? If God tells us what to do, we will follow. So he comes back and says, well, what God says is don't flee to Egypt. Stay in that land of Judah. And God says he will save you. 
And so upon hearing that, what do these people do? Now, remember, what did they say at first? Jeremiah, tell us what God will say, God says to you. We will obey. That's what they had said. So Jeremiah said, okay, stay in the land. That's what God says. But Jeremiah chapter 43, listen to what they say. Back to Jeremiah. Azariah, son of Hoshaya, and Johanan, son of Kareah, and all the arrogant men said to Jeremiah, You are lying! The Lord our God has not sent you to say, You must not go to Egypt to settle there. But Baruch, son of Neriah, is inciting you against us to hand us over to the Babylonians so they may kill us or carry us into exile to Babylon. There's something wrong here? These people actually said, Jeremiah, through you, whatever God says, we will obey. So, okay. So, Jeremiah says, God says, don't leave. Stay in the land of Judah. And then what do they say? You're lying. It shows us why these people refuse to listen to God. And it's because they only hear what they want to hear. They only listen to what they want to listen to. But friends, being honest with ourselves, isn't that what we do also? We want God's word, but he pushes that thing that's in us that we refuse to let anyone else, not anyone else ever touch it. If God speaks to that, we refuse to hear. Sometimes when we get blessed by sermon, we only get blessed by the message, part of the message that we like to hear. You see, this DNA to want to hear whatever we want to hear only is in us too. These Israelites are not just Israelites. That Israelites are us. In fact, we now live in a day and age where we only hear what we want to hear all the more, more than ever. You know, there are some of you who may have felt like Oh, you know, this past week or last couple of weeks, God's been just sending me these, uh, you know, uh, videos, right, on my YouTube. And whenever I, I go to computer and internet and, and YouTube and these, you know, videos are coming and God must be speaking. Holy Spirit must be sending these videos to us and to me. Well, let me tell you, it's not the Holy Spirit. You know what it is? It's called algorithm. It's not the rhythm of the Holy Spirit. It's algorithm. If it's rhythm, it's the rhythm of my desires. That's what it is. You see, the moment you click on that one video, this big hand that's in control, whatever that thing is, now keeps track of your record of what you clicked on. You guys all know this, right? And what you clicked on, so next time it will send you similar videos that will suit your taste and what you want to watch and hear and listen. Now, don't get me wrong. God, you can use that video. But I'm talking about this uh, careless uh, uh, belief that says, well, just because it's been coming in my account and coming in my phone and on my computer, that it must be the Holy Spirit. Again, it's not the rhythm of the Holy Spirit. It's the rhythm of your desires that keep giving you these videos. You actually have set yourself up for it. And that's why they keep coming to you. But what's happening is that we keep getting fed these things again and again. What happens is our views become narrow because that's all we are getting, right? You watch this one thing and you kind of agree and then it keeps coming more, more, more. And, and what happens is that becomes your absolute truth. No wonder why there's so much conflict when it comes to this view, that view, more than ever. It's because everyone's just getting that one view, narrow view that, that we are happy with. We like hearing and listening to. And we get so stuck in that track of, you know, a thinking and way of thinking that we have no room for discussion and dialogue anymore. Now, again, God can use that video. But I'm just saying, use it wisely. What would that mean? Well, let's think of it this way. Give you an example. You just keep getting these videos that show you how to be healthy, right? It's all about healthy. Now, know and discern that it's not God saying to you through the videos, physically be healthy. 
What it just means is that that's what you're interested in these days. Know that. Discern that. Now, is it wrong to be, to have a healthy body? It's not. But you don't decide that because that video told you to be healthy. You stay healthy physically because Word of God says, live, uh, offer your bodies as living sacrifice. You do that because of the Word of God, not because you kept getting video after video about your health. So you look at that and go, instead of going, oh, Holy Spirit must be telling me, you look at that and go, this is what I'm thinking about a lot these days. And you take that and be wise and you analyze and interpret it. How? Okay, I'm thinking a lot about physical health these days. What is God saying through this? Am I keeping my balance? Am I just so focused on just my physical health that my spiritual well-being is something that I'm not thinking about? If you're just getting these videos after videos about one way of looking at things, maybe that's wise way of dealing with that is you look at it and say, maybe I ought to just check those who feel differently about this. And you look at these other videos and you analyze it. You balance it out. I think we live in a day and age where we just just get drunk on what we want to hear. And the world is set up that way, in such a way that it will feed you whatever you want to hear, and you will get drunk on it. And that's all you will hear. We need wisdom. We need wisdom. Otherwise, we're going to become like these people of Israel. All they did was they just heard whatever they wanted to hear, and it led to their destruction. Don't you think that's what's happening a lot if you look around us these days, right? So many people just seem to be so convinced about a certain way of looking at things or issue, and they live and die by it. But you realize it's like, why are they so extreme? Because all they're getting is they're drunk on whatever they want to hear. Again and again and again and again. You look at it and go, okay, it's time for me to balance out my life. Hey, I'll be very open with you. You know, I open my phone. I don't know why, but I'm starting getting these videos about how to do a good backhand tennis. I don't know why. (laughs) I wonder why. I never, like, look for it. But next time, you know, I open it up, it's like giving me, like, okay, this is how you do your forehand topspin. Why does it keep coming to me? Is the Holy Spirit telling me I need to play more tennis? Okay, instead of once a week, I should just play every day. It must be the Holy Spirit, right? You know what I'm saying, right? I'm getting those videos because I've searched them. (laughs) And somehow they figure out to get to this guy's wallet, I need to send this guy tennis videos, and then it's coming now. (laughs) Right? But just to just to to my defense, right? I get a lot of worship services too. Just letting you know. Just letting you know. Not just all tennis, all right? Anyway, just an example. I'm being honest and showing you. And then what do I do? I balance myself. Okay. It's a sign. It's a sign. I need to make sure that I don't let this hobby become something that's unbalanced and unhealthy because I'm so into it, too much into it, right? But fortunately, the Bible is not just about stories of sons who fail, but there's one son who lives differently, and that son is Jesus Christ. John chapter 8, verse 28 says, Jesus said, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He and that I do nothing of my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. You see, Jesus is not only the Son of God, He's also God the Son. And yet, He says, I listen to the Father. John chapter 5, verse 30, my, By myself, I can do nothing. I judge judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but God, Him who sent me. Here, we're talking about Jesus. Son of God, God the Son, and He's saying, I can do nothing by myself. What? You're Jesus. You know the heart of the Father perfectly, and yet here He is saying, 
I can do nothing on my own. I have to listen to my father first. Wisdom comes when we begin to truly listen. Now, how does listening to God lead to wisdom? I'll answer that question and end our sermon today. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Jesus, by listening to the Father and doing what he told him to, which is go to the cross, not only became the power of God, but it also says he became the wisdom of God. And what was that wisdom of God that was displayed on the cross? All the enemies of Jesus looked at Jesus on the cross as he died on the cross, including the ultimate enemy, Satan, looked at Jesus as he died on the cross. The enemy and the enemies went, yes, we won. We beat God. We killed him. He's dead. But Jesus listened to the Father and obeyed him died on the cross, and he became, on that cross, salvation for the world. You see, it was so wise that only God could think of something so foolishness to the world. The world looked at the cross and said, foolishness only for these uh, uh, losers that die on the cross, and yet God chose the cross to bring salvation. What wisdom of God is this? Only God could think of something like this. When we go to Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, Faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is through the word about Christ. Even salvation comes to those who listen and hear. If you don't listen and hear the gospel, refuse to hear it, then salvation doesn't come. That's how important listening and hearing is. But what happens is when that salvation comes to a person, that person goes through a fundamental change within him or herself. And that fundamental change is now the spirit in you that was dead is born again. So now you're capable of hearing God's message, understanding it, and living out that message that you hear from God. That's the fundamental change that takes place. So, John chapter 5, verse 25 says, Very truly I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. So those who hear will live. This is talking about salvation, but I think it means more than just salvation and when we die and go to heaven kind of salvation those of us who hear hear what hear the word of god we become alive we become alive in our spirit so we hear the message of god we can understand it we can process it we can begin to live it and as we do so god's wisdom begins to flow through us that's what happens when we Choose to listen. But what do we do? We refuse to listen to God. Are you still refusing to listen to what God is telling you over and over and over again? He says, He keeps saying to you, don't judge your life by your possession. Like he's been, he says, He told the Israelites over and over again, He's been telling you all your life and you still don't listen. No wonder you don't live truly because you refuse to listen to what God is saying to you again and again and again. He keeps saying to you, don't cling on to your wounds and keep saying that that's the reason why you act this way and that certain way. What God is saying to you over and over again is you are no longer bound by your pain and wound and yet you keep clinging on to it and you refuse to listen to what he has to say and you continue to live through that wound that you have bitterness that you have he keeps saying you're no longer that person of bitterness but you keep refusing to hear and you say no i am i am that person of bitterness so instead of living 
truly living. We merely exist and we don't live fully. You may think, well, no, I listen. When God's message is delivered, I get blessed. Yes, I know, we do. But what I'm talking about is that one thing in all of us that we have deep in our hearts and even and that even God cannot make us listen and hear. I'm talking about that thing. For some of you, it could be, it could be your pride. Others of you, it could be the way you see the world. Or again, thing that you're clinging on to saying, I'll never let this go. You'll let go of all the other things if God says let it go. But if God says, I want you to let go of that thing, oh, I, I don't listen. I can't listen to God. But let's go back to our verse, verse 8. It calls us to listen, but this is a language of a father calling his son, saying, listen, my son. That's with the heart that God is calling us to listen to him. It's out of this love, care, for us that he says, would you listen to me? If you do, you'll be free. If you truly listen to what I have to say about this issue, that issue, then you'll become free and you'll live this life, that life of abundance that I have prepared for you. It's out of that heart that God says to us, listen, listen. It's not listen, it's listen, my son. If you're like me, and I hope you are in some ways that, that I'm not the only one, but, you know, all those regrets that we have in the past, right? Like, oh, in that moment, I refused to listen to God, and I paid for it big time. And then you learn your lesson. And then something else happens. God says, do this. You refuse to listen again, and then you pay for it again. And how many times we go through this lesson over and over again, and we keep refusing to listen to what God has to say. And who pay for, pays for it? We pay for it again. If there's any little bit of wisdom that God has given me or blessed me with, is realizing that pattern. And I began really trying to listen to what God has to say. Even if it's hard, even if it's difficult. And through that, I realized wisdom, little bit, little by little, begins to flow flow and I begin to truly live because I'm not paying for that lesson again with my refusal to hear to God. So we want to take the, these steps towards wisdom. The first step was trust. Here's the second step and it's our takeaway. Wisdom comes from listening. Listening. I would say the advantage and the uh, positive aspect of our Western education and worldview and philosophy is this independence, right? So when we go to university study, you, you don't listen to anybody, but you actually research it and you study it and you figure it out for yourself and you don't let anyone speak into whatever that issue is. That's kind of like the Western tradition, but, you know, coming from not just Western tradition, but Eastern and biblical tradition, tradition that comes from and out of the Bible is... Standing and sitting under the feet of someone who's wise, but not only wise, but loves you and cares for you. You lay down your own beliefs and desires, and you truly, truly listen. And out of that comes life, life. And I think that's something that some of us, many of us are missing out on because we grew up in this part of the world and this culture and tradition where no, I'm independent. I don't let anybody speak into my life except myself. If I am convinced, I will listen. But I won't let anybody else convince me. And I think that's, we pay for it. Because we become very stubborn sometimes. We refuse to hear. Refuse to listen. And our society and our world is paying for it. Because we refuse to listen to God. We used to. 
but we refuse now, and we're paying for it. So instead of responding to your own voice and your own desire and your own words and thoughts, would you, as the praise team comes back up, would you listen to God? If he tells you today, this one thing, I want you to listen to me. And if he says that, say yes, yes, I will listen. I will listen. You know best, better than I know myself. So I want to invite you to stand and let's sing our last song. I believe that we are going to repeat that same song one more time. So we'll let the praise team lead us into a time of response through this song.